Actually, the Komodo dragons are not quite as fierce as they look. Polar bears, on the other hand, look very furry and very cuddly, and they kill quite a few people every year. They can also run and climb and swim faster than a man, so it's sensible not to get within spitting distance, unlike this seal. So, here's another simple question. How would you get close enough to get pictures like these, remembering that a polar bear is always hungry, that you look like food to him, and that he never bothers to say grace before he eats? Well, in Canada, scientists have discovered the ideal place for observing polar bears. It's a cliff top from where they can look down on the snow and ice below where the bears live. Down below, the bears can look up at the scientists, hoping one of them will venture down one day and become supper. This is called ecology. The scientists have even constructed a lavatory with a door containing a bear-shaped observation hole so that one cameraman can sit inside in comfort and safety while the rest form a queue outside. But Hugh Miles, the BBC cameraman, has a problem. From up here, his zoom lens can turn a distant dot into a recognisable polar bear and coming this way. But it's not close enough to satisfy him. So what does he do? Well, he does something that no sane man would ever do and goes to the bottom of the cliff till the bear is only 25 yards away. And then, like an idiot, he unscrews his flask of hot soup, which the bear suddenly smells. And if the bear hadn't got somewhere better to go to, our film at this point would turn into a tribute to the late Hugh Miles. A rather more restful job for Hugh Miles was standing motionless for hour after hour, day after day, in a reed bed in Yugoslavia, filming the elusive little bittern from his hide. The main snag, apart from leeches climbing up his legs, was that when a bittern sees a camera, he goes behind a reed stem. So you turn to the young of the species, which has not yet acquired this knack, but he does seem to be learning quite fast. Cameraman Neil Rettig's problem was to find out how to film a rhea, a bird very like an ostrich. His solution? To build a portable hide looking very like an ostrich. And here he is modelling the scaffolding. And here is the rhea, unless of course it's Neil in disguise. And here is the crowd that always gathers whenever filming's taking place anywhere in the world. The message from these cows is obvious. Why film a stupid bird like a rear when you can film a dozen handsome pieces of beefcake like us? And if you try to film the rear's nest, the message is similar. Why bother with eggs when you've got a handsome armadillo willing to stride through them with all the confidence of Delia Smith among the omelettes? What the armadillo doesn't realize is that natural history filmmakers aren't really interested in nature only in the bit they're trying to film. The strange creature with the snout like an Italian handbag is an anteater. The strange creature with earphones and a snout like a mind detector is a human being called Dickie Bird, who is a sound recordist and together they're engaged in the strange ritual dance called getting some background noise. Ants and such like are easier meat. They pay no attention to you and they carry on as if they ruled the world, which perhaps they do. Filming termites and ants above ground isn't too bad, but when you film them below ground, it gets harder. In South America, they wanted to film the grass-cutting ant. Now, this makes colonies which takes up to 15 or 20 million ants at a time, but not a cameraman. So what they did was to bring the ants all the way from South America here and put them in this thing, which looks like a French horn made by Henry Moore while well drunk, and they put them down the inside, which is actually like an ant tunnel, and followed them with an endoscope, which is the sort of lens you put down people to see what their supper looks like five minutes after they've eaten it.
Believe it or not, more trouble was taken over these little goslings than any other creature in the living planet. From the moment they were born, they were destined to grow up and be in it. They are red-breasted geese, and their mother is a goose, but they don't know that. They think their mother is Mrs. Rose Eastman, and at the moment they think she's just a pair of red gumboots. If these geese go on growing up with their human mother goose, identifying with her voice and her red gumboots, there's a good chance that they will sooner or later fly after her, if she moves fast enough, and yield dramatic pictures of flight. At first, she just takes them for walks with her voice now on a cassette, but soon available on LP and single. And the next step was to put Mrs Eastman on a bicycle and see if the birds followed her. All this proved really was that flying is a much quicker way of travelling than bicycling. So then it was on to the final crucial stage in which Mother is put in a car, sticking out of the top like the Queen, together with a cameraman. There's more to the living planet than just wildlife and exotic locations. There are backroom boys as well. And here in sun-drenched Boreham Wood lives the globe, which featured in every episode of the living planet. But even filming a globe is no picnic. For a start, you have to carry it in without dropping it. Uh, Maggie, is, it, is this really the best of all possible worlds? I mean, if you were in a BBC satellite looking down, would the Earth look like this? No, it wouldn't look like this because you wouldn't really be able to see very much of the landmass at all. It would be all cloud and sea. If you could see through the clouds, it would look pretty much like this. We've accentuated the colouring in certain areas, like the green of the forest, so that they stand out. But uh, obviously there would be some cloud over the Earth, so we've actually devised another globe for this. What we do is we film this globe first and then this globe afterwards and the white areas here come out as cloud on our base globe. Filming the globe turning is a bit like walking around Britain wearing bedroom slippers. Very slow, and very boring. To turn the globe completely once, you have to turn that handle 5,000 times and let the camera click over once with each turn of the handle. In other words, it turns far slower than the real thing. And people wonder why TV programmes take so long to make. 